For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Welcome to this awakened generation with your host, Mazino Abraham Eboku. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The Bible says to be spiritually minded is life. It's life. It's peace. And the Bible says that the spiritual mind or the spiritual man is a different person from the natural man. The natural man does not understand the things of the spirit. That's why things take them by surprise. The spiritual mind is, is alert. The spiritual man is, when he's doing certain things, people are laughing. Until the realization comes that what you are seeing here has been taken care of there. Hallelujah. So the spiritual mind is sensitive, is keen, is mindful. May God continue to raise us up as we continue in this fast. We still have slightly, I think, over a week to go. And hallelujah. And you still have the opportunity to press in to God. You still have the opportunity to press in to God. So I want to continue to challenge you not to undermine spiritual things. And not to give up, to persist in spiritual things. It's not foolhardy for us to pray and to continue to pray. It's not foolhardy for us to fast and to continue to fast as the Lord leads us. It's not a foolish thing when we come together in the assembly of one another. And we forsake not the assembly. It's not a foolish thing for us to put our hands on the plow for the glory of God. This life is a lot of cause and effect. And what you sow into is what you're going to reap. If you sow into life, you will reap life. If you sow into spiritual things, you will reap life and immortality. So I challenge you, get deeper into the things of the Spirit. Get deeper in prayer and in the fasting. Get deeper in intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Spending time with the Holy Spirit. Get deeper with the Word, with your Word. With the Word of God surrounding yourself. There is no shortcut with God. So you know where you are at now. You know it by yourself. Nobody else needs to tell you. You know. You know whether you are sowing to things of the Spirit or whether you are not. And that's what Galatians tells us. Yes, Roman tells us to be carnally minded is death. But to spiritual minded is life and peace. Galatians says the same thing. Galatians chapter 6 and I think from 6 to 9 or 7 to 9 it says do not be deceived God cannot be mocked let's take 7 to 9 God cannot be mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap and when we see all the turbulence happening all around us particularly as the days go by as the days go by, the Bible says sin and wickedness is increasing. But those of us who sow in the Spirit, God will preserve you. God will uphold you. God will sustain you. God himself will promote you in the name of Jesus. God will bless his people. He desires. The Bible says he delights. He delights in the prosperity of his people. If I'm not, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, there's a scripture I think is Zephaniah, thank you. Am I correct? 370? 
Say, God will rejoice over you. Ze Zephaniah. Not Zephaniah. The Lord thy God. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will deliver. He will heal. You know, sometimes just being in an atmosphere is a blessing on his own. You know, it's just like a man who found a, a land. People are looking for land. And my land has something precious. Oil, fertile, something. Other lands may not have it. Just being in the atmosphere of God. <laughs> just being in the atmosphere of God. Just as some people were around Jesus. Some people were not around him. Then there were people who made themselves to be around him. They made themselves, you know. Bible says that one woman, Greek, she made herself. She came. Yeah, we we'll find you. And when she found him, the disciples tried to block her. No, you can't see him. She tried. No. Force yourself into the atmosphere of God. See the great things. It's awesome. Things will happen for you that will not happen if you're not there. Let me repeat again. Get yourself to get into the atmosphere of God by any way possible. Force yourself into that atmosphere. Things happen in that atmosphere. Great thing. He will say, He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in His love. And He will joy over thee with singing. Who knew that God sang? Zephaniah saw it. God sings. And He sings because He is mighty in our midst. Let us make Him mighty in our midst. Let's separate ourselves unto this God. Let's walk in sanctification so he'll be pleased to dwell in our midst. Let's, let's live a life that is pleasing to him. Let's praise this God. Let's honor him just so that our atmosphere can be an atmosphere where he is comfortable to be. Hallelujah! Praise God. Yes. We've actually been talking about who are you. And just like the other two parts of these messages or this message, I had used the premise, foundation of my message, the context of this message to be in John, where the Jews came to ask John the Baptist, who are you? What do you say of yourself? It was a spiritual question. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It was a spiritual question. Who are you? And I, I need also to understand, if you didn't understand it before, that it is still a spiritual question. It's a question that you cannot come to this earth and leave this earth without answering it. And if you've, you've heard the cry from the Lord, if you've heard the call from the Lord, it's a question that you just have to answer. You can't sit back because at the end of your time, of your, your departure will come. Many of us don't like to talk about it, but even Paul, before he died, he told them, the time of my departure is at hand. He was not even sick. He just knew that the time was going to come. He knew that it was, it was ripe. It was, it was time. He just knew it in his heart that it was at hand. I don't know for whatever reason, but I know that the leading of the Holy Spirit is there. The voice of God is there. The time of my departure is at hand. So he said to them, I have fought the good fight. This has to be your testimony and my testimony. As spiritual people, Remember, we're not, we're not carnally minded. The carnal mind is thinking like the world thinks. The carnal mind is interested in the things that the world is interested in. We are not like that. When God saved us, he saved us to deliver us. The Bible says he has delivered us and translated us. There's a translation. You can't remain there. You can't keep yourself there. The things that interest them should no longer interest us. If we are truly been translated. And that's why I say that these are the signs of true salvation. And also these are the signs of apostasy. When we find ourselves enjoying the things that the world enjoys. The way the world enjoys them. Just understand that one, you were never really saved. If you've never found yourself on the other side. Or you have begun to backslide. And you are growing, drifting to apostasy. We, we are not, we, you see... This is not a factor of just dossier the Lord. It's a factor of essence. 
the nature of a thing. That's the essence. The nature of a thing. The characteristic of a thing. When you have a lion that is born, if you watch some of the documentaries that I watch, you will see tigers, lions, and they culture them. They take them away from their parents, or maybe they were dying, or left abandoned, they killed the mother. They take them, and they pick them in a, an environment. You don't tell the tiger or the lion before a while. As they are growing, it's in their nature to begin to want to fight. It's in their nature to want to scratch. It's in their nature to want to be violent, aggressive, wild. It's just in their nature. And there are some attributes of God that have to be in your nature. If they are not being manifested, you have to check yourself. Praise God. So, it has to be in your nature that you find out, you ask yourself, are these things of God? Are they really, am I seeing them? Does, is God really interested in the things that the world is interested in? The things that you are celebrating today, ask yourself, are these the things the Holy Spirit is celebrating? The things that you are enjoying now, ask yourself, are these the things? It's so easy to answer the question by the essence, by the essence, by the essence. Unfortunately, we've had situations where proactively our local assemblies, not all, many have pushed us back to worldliness. Because by essence, many of even our local settings, they are worldly by essence. They have backslidden. They don't know. And what I'm saying is not a judgmental, condemning thing. It's a warning. It's a warning in the sense that same thing John came to warn by the Spirit. Say, Laodicea, you people are bubbling. Sadis, you people are bubbling. In fact, everybody has a testimony of that you are alive. You are dead. That's what he said to Sadis Church in, 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 in Revelations 3.1. He says, everybody has this testimony that you are alive. You are dead. Dead how? Dead to God in the spirit realm. God knows it. And demons know it. That's why in Romans and chapter 13. 13. I think it will be around 8, 9, 10. It says, awake. Oh, no, man. MC level. Yeah. And that knowing that time, that the time, that now is high time to awake out of sleep. And he goes on to tell us to put on Christ. Because the carnal church, the worldly minded church, is sleeping, but they don't know it. They are sleeping. You have the testimony that you are alive. You are not. You are dying. He says there are some of you strengthening that which remains. And I speak prophetically to those who are listening to me today. Strengthen that which remains. And some of you, you even have an outward appearance that you are really this bubbly Christian. You are not. You are dying and you are dying. You, are, you, have, you have moved far away from God. And the devil is going to disconnect you from God if you continue in that right. To the point that he will make you turn against God. Do you know Satan can make you turn against God? When Paul was speaking about the time of his departure, they had a common friend. His name was Demas. And he said to him, he says, look, the time of my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight of faith. I finished my course. Now there is laid for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge will give. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, from verse 6 to verse 10. To all those who love his appearing. But the next thing that he says, I said verse 6 to verse 10. The next thing that he says is that, I think this is 9 and 10. He says, but Demas has left me. See, for Demas has forsaken me. Why? I, 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 I sense in my spirit that I need to speak to somebody. I don't know where you're sitting here. I don't know where you're listening to me online or by television or by audio. Somebody has forsaken Christ. Demas has forsaken me. The love of this world. You are captivated by the things of this world. The things that the world is captivated by. You know, two of us, myself and another sister or brother, 
Somebody can own even the most expensive car in the world and is not captivated by it. Yet another person can own it and be captivated. It's a judgment of the heart. You have to judge your heart. What is occupying your heart? What is gri gripping your heart? What's directing your heart? I say prophetically, turn around before it's too late. Turn around before it's too late. Go come to the better side. It's a glorious side. Move on to the righteous side. Move up to the righteous side of God. It's a glorious side. And if you only knew that your beauty came from this life and from this side, many of us, if not most, if not all, who are truly saved, will attest that in the times where we were in the world, we thought that we had the best life. Just like those in the world today, they think there's nothing better than what they are doing now. They are partying, they are nightclubbing, they are doing all these things. When we see these people in the nightclubs and we see the prostitutes, I mean, on the all night, when I was living all night, driving home, I just come and see wonderful saints crying to the Lord, praying. And we're just having a powerful time in the Lord. We left home almost floating, some of us, in the spirit with joy and, and, and just the glory of God. As we're going, we're watching prostitutes fighting themselves and pimps who are trying to pick them up fighting themselves. And we're seeing them. And, and, and for some of us, it was our life before. And we wish we could just tell them. But there's something we can do. There's something we can do. But they think in their mind that they're having a great life. And it seems great until you have tasted of the Lord. It's just like now, those who are, have caught up backsliding into worldliness. You think that you are, you are doing something great. You are enjoying the pornography that you are enjoying. You are enjoying the lustfulness that you are enjoying. You think it's great. There's something better for you that Satan is stealing from you. Every time he's pushing you backwards, it's because he's stealing something that's forward in your life. Every time he's pushing you backwards into the world, there's something forward of God that he's trying to steal from you, and you don't know it. There's a beauty. It may not mean much to you, but it means a lot to me that in 1990, just a year before I finally gave my life to Christ, I was in the verge of committing suicide. I gave myself every reason to believe that I will, I need to die. I gave myself every reason to believe that life was not worth it. How foolish was I? Satan was trying to steal all of you here. Satan was trying to steal every great and glorious thing that God has used me to accomplish. Satan was trying to steal my worship that I was going to give to God. How blind was I? How blind will you be to allow them to push you back because of the great thing that God wants to use you for? You have to yield yourself to God and move in the direction of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so, we started the series, Who Am I? And I said to you that you have to define your life. The Bible, God defines you by your mission. That's why it is easy for God to say to the Laodiceans that you are blind. You are foolish. You are wretched. That should be Revelation 3 and Verse 16, 17. It says, because you say you are rich and increase the goods. I need you to understand this. You see, their mission is different from the mission of the Christian. By the world standard, they are rich. Indeed, by world standard, they are rich. Indeed, by world standard, they are increased in goods. But by God's standard, they are wretched and miserable. Is it a wretchedness that men can see? No. The same thing is said. It says they are poor and blind. Is it a poverty or a blindness that men can see? No. That's why we say you, we have to renew our minds. Because when we see a little descent, if you are not a man of the spirit or a woman of the spirit, you say, whoa, they are rich in goods. They are glorious. They are special. But he says, don't you know that they are wretched? Carnal minds can't see these things. Because they are seeing the things that the world sees. Don't you know they are miserable? They are poor. They are blind. They are naked. That's the same thing James says in James chapter 5 to the rich people. He says, you rich people. Who cheat people, deceive people, do all of these things. 
He said, don't you know that your garments, say your riches are corrupted and your garments are, are moth eaten. That's rich people though. Very wealthy people. There is no way. Those people's clothes are clothed in scarlet. Beautiful for the man to see, eyes to see. But he's looking at the realm of the spirit. In the realm of the spirit, a lot of people that you think you are celebrating, they are moat eating their garments. They are wretched. May God cause us to grow deeper and deeper in him so we can see clearer and clearer as he sees. As he sees. Praise God. So who are you? It was a question that Jesus himself had to answer. And so in Luke, from chapter 4, I will eventually get to chapter verse 18. I think we just go to 18. But before I begin to read Luke 18, I want to tell you what had happened. Jesus had come on age. He was about 30 years by now. And it was time to go out. Prior to now, he had just been a carpenter. And as a carpenter, we know he had always been involved in the work of his father. Because we had known how that at the age of 12, he went to teach in the synagogue. So he had been teaching even at a low level from a young boy. He had been involved in the work of God. But now, God was about to make a public spectacle of him. To show the whole world who he was. So the time of his announcement or what the scriptures call the time of his showing had come. So one of the first things he did was that he went into a long period of fasting. So from verse 1 we begin to see how that he went to the wilderness and he was praying and he was fasting for 40 days and for 40 nights. You can stay in verse 18 actually. And so he was praying and he was fasting for 40 days and for 40 nights he was at this. When he finished, the Bible says he came back in the power of the Spirit. Which is very important to us. Which is the same thing he said to the disciples, tarry in Jerusalem. That every time we want to really do the work of God, every time we want to launch out, we must get anointed. We must get a fresh empowerment from heaven. We must take time out to wait on the Lord, to worship him. To drink from the Lord. To hear from Him. To receive matching orders. Separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for what exactly what I have to do. Sometimes, when we wait on the Lord, it is to tell us clearly, no, you are not to go to Asia. Like He told uh, Paul and Go in, in Acts and chapter 16. So you are not going to Asia. You are not going to Bithynia. Because their plan was that, whoa, maybe there are many souls there. says, no, this is what we do. That's why God checks us. And when, when, many times we, we launch out into God and say so we're just going out and what we're doing may even be good. But it's not God. Because we didn't wait. And we haven't spent time. Waiting on the Lord makes us that empowered. It prepares us. And that's what prepared Jesus. So Jesus came out and he was about to declare what his mission was. In other words, Luke chapter 4 and verse 18 Becomes a declaration from verse 18 of the destiny of Jesus on earth. Why did he come? Prior to now, he has not made it public. He has not announced it. So if you read the prior verse, it will tell you something like, so he went to the synagogue, that was his usual custom. And when he got to the synagogue, he took up the scroll of the Bible and began to read. And this is the scripture he read. In the book of Isaiah, he read Isaiah. In front of the whole church, everybody there, the priests, the, the uh, high, all the different uh, who is who is there. And he began to quote Isaiah. This was the same thing John the Baptist did. Spiritual men and women, we are not defined by our occupation. Your occupation is good. It might surprise you. I, I, that's my thinking. I cannot prove it fully, but I can prove it by insinuating that Jesus continued his carpentry business. I believe so. I believe he continued it by proxy, though. I believe that he raised another MD because we know he had younger brothers, half-brothers. 
So there was James, there was Jonah, there was Simeon, his young, his younger brothers, by Joseph and Mary. And he had sisters. I believe that some of them continued the business. I believe that even that business partially funded his, his ministry. I'm trying to put myself here. I, I don't just think that Jesus will just close it and say, eh, Jesus Furniture Shop, close down. I know carpenters those days built houses. When you hear somebody say carpenter, those days or a tent maker, they, they build tents. They build, it's not just, they, because a lot of the things that they were built there was a lot of wooden stuff. So, so, I don't think it, I think it would be wasteful. And I think that because Jesus is not wasteful, I think it would be unwise. I think because Jesus is wise, I do not think that his business just closed down. So, I am not against anybody. What we are saying has nothing to do with your business or your occupation being a bad thing. Your occupation is a good thing. God wants you to excel and be dexterous. God wants you to be diligent in what you put your hands to do. But God wants you to see yourself for who you are first. Whatever you are, whoever you are, whatever you are doing. So, I am a, a newscaster. I am a pilot. I am a consultant of business. I am an IT specialist. All good. But in that place, in that platform that God has given you, He wants you to see yourself executing the mission He has sent you for. Because some of us will never get the opportunity to execute that mission where you are going to execute it. That's why we are all priests and kings unto God. Last week, we set up a WhatsApp group we call God's Priests and Prophets. And if you want to join that WhatsApp group, you have to find a way to get a message to one of us somehow or the other so we can put you in. We started to read a book by one of the most discredited women in the whole of the world. Satan fought this woman to a standstill. Her name is Rebecca Brown. In fact, I was in a pastor the other day and I said, oh, we're reading Rebecca Brown. He said, I know, that woman, she's a lie. It has been proven that everything she said is a lie. I said, this is what has happened to the church. What That's what happens. Let me tell you something today. If God, a dead man comes here and we pray for him and he's raised from the dead. If we take the story out, some will believe. But the devil will make sure that you are, they will turn you into a liar. This woman was fired from her work because she started praying in her office. She began to understand, enter into a dimension in God called priesthood. Where she understood that I'm a doctor, but I am here for what more than medicine. She understood that, yes, I will use the tools that I have learned from school. I will treat people. However, by the time she was praying and praying, she found people were dying, dying, dying all the time. So as she began to pray, God began to show her the operation of witchcraft. I'm not going to mention names, but some of you will agree with me. There are some specific hospitals, not just in Lagos, in this our country and all over the world. It's not only Rebecca's brown office in a co uh, country where she was in San Diego or wherever she was in California. It is even here. Do you know that? I have personally ministered to people who have either been delivered or they've gotten involved with hospitals where there is demonic operation happening.